Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to the CSIAC webinar. Uh, thank you all for joining thus far. My name is Brian Benish. I'm uh, with uh, the IAC operation with CSIAC. And um, just want to first welcome you and then give you a quick introduction to who uh, we are, who CSIAC is, what we do, um, and then give you a, a couple details about the webinar platform and any meeting, um, how, we're gonna, how you can navigate that and uh, utilize the question and answer portion at the end. Um, so just quickly, CSIAC, we are the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center. We are a, a DOD entity organizationally within USDRE, uh, the Office of Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, which is then under DTIC, the Defense Technical Information Center. Uh, DTIC is most well known for their r &E Gateway, which is a library that holds millions of DOD and other federally funded reports and other scientific and technical information. And so CSI was stood up uh, under DTIC and to help those working in particular here, the cybersecurity domain of the DOD research and engineering field, to help them find information they need to get a, a head start on any technical project they might be working on. Uh, we're staffed with technical researchers who understand the cybersecurity DOD landscape and uh, provide we provide research analysis services uh, to customers, help them find information they are, are looking for, best practices, um, help create some collaborative opportunities between government, industry, academia, what have you, again, to give you a head start on your projects. Um, and so one way we achieve that is through uh, these webinar presentations that we host. We want to create an awareness of work that's being done, again, through that cyber, in that cybersecurity DOD community. Um, and so webinars are a great way for us to kind of present and, and highlight that in, that work um, to, again, help create some uh, opportunities for collaboration, hopefully eliminate some redundancy and stimulate some innovation. So um, we hope you enjoy this presentation uh, from Phil. And before we uh, pass it over to Phil, just a couple quick notes about uh, the Any Meeting platform. For those who are joined in, uh, you can, uh, in the online platform, you can submit a question at any time during the presentation. There should be a little dialog box at the top center of your screen. If you click that, click add a new question, you can put that in the queue and we'll get to those uh, at the end. Um, I do want to distinguish that from the chat feature, which should be on the left hand side. Uh, you can use that to, to chat with myself or Phil during the presentation, but I uh, would encourage you if you have a question, you could uh, submit that again with the audience question. Um, prompt or icon in the top middle of the screen. Um, if you have any technical difficulties at all during this presentation, uh, rest assured that it's being recorded. We'll, we'll send out a, a link to that at the end, or I should say tomorrow, uh, so you can access that if you do have any issues. If you're dialed in by phone only and are listening in via, by audio without the, the, sl the slides immediately in front of you, you can go on our website and download the PDF version of the slides and follow along with that. Uh, you just go to csiac.org, uh, go to webinars under our resources drop down, and find this webinars webpage. And there's a, a link there where you can directly download the slides. Um, I'll go ahead in just a few moments, drop that link into the chat as well, so you can grab them for those who, again, who are in the, the platform. So uh, I think that is enough logistics. If you do have any other uh, questions uh, about or interest in, in CSI, I would encourage you to go to the website. It's where you can get the latest and greatest uh, set of information about CSI, so csiac.org. Um, and we'd be happy to answer any uh, questions that you have from there. So without further ado, I will hand the mic over to Phil for his presentation. Phil, the floor is yours. Thanks, Brian. Uh... Good afternoon or good morning, depending where you're dialed in from. Uh, my name is Philip Payne. Uh, I am the CSI Act Technical Lead. Uh, before I get into it, just to give you guys a little bit of background by my, about myself, uh, I was actually highlighted in our CSI Act Digest, which is our newsletter, which comes out uh, approximately every three weeks um, for the last Digest. We just had one that came out yesterday as well. Hopefully you guys are signed up and subscribed to receive that as well. Um, but my, my background is in computer engineering. Um, my degrees, as far as my bachelor's and master's, are both in computer engineering from Johns Hopkins University and NYU Polytechnic, respectively. Um, I worked at the US Army CERDEC, now known as C5ISR, for approximately 10 years, um, mostly working <clears throat> in defensive cyber research and development, 
6263 work. Um, also led their cross domain solution um, testing lab prior to my departure. Um, I started here at Service Engineering Company in January 2018, um, was supporting an Army customer doing cyber AOAs analysis of alternatives. And that's where uh, this methodology, uh, the network survivability assessment methodology, was actually created. Um, and like I said, I became the CSI technical lead uh, about a couple months ago. Uh, the IAC has welcomed me with open arms, um, and the membership, as well as our subject matter experts from CSIAC, has um, been. We have a very active membership, a very passionate membership. So uh, I'm looking forward to the opportunity to uh, present to you guys today. Um, with that said, uh, the network survivability assessment methodology. Um, this is something created to do cyber AOAs um, analysis of alternative um, is an analytical comparison of operational effectiveness, suitability, uh, life cycle costs. Um, the Army customer we were working with um, when we created this methodology had a lot of experience of doing AOAs um, and a lot of the other illities, uh, whether that be survivability, lethality, uh, maneuverability, looking at costs, things like that, but not necessarily with, with cyber. Um, so this is a this is a methodology focused on um, helping you do a cyber airway early in the acquisition life, life cycle. Um, there are many challenges doing uh, an airway early in the acquisition life cycle because lots of times you don't necessarily have your piece of software fully built or your box um, in hand that you can actually poke holes in or red team or do modeling and simulation and use virtualization technologies and things like that. A lot of times it's a paper analysis uh, so this methodology is something that can be used um, to help facilitate cyber tabletop workshops um, with subject matter experts in the room. Um, it's a loose framework. Um, it, it provides a lot of modularity. Um, so there's things um, within the methodology that can be changed um, to best suit your needs uh, moving forward. So you don't necessarily have to stick exactly to it um, in order for it to be helpful to you. Um, so as we move forward, uh, this is the process outline. Overall, uh, it's a seven step process. Um, at the beginning, we wanna identify our mission sets. Tying everything to the mission um, is a key component uh, to this methodology, especially early on where you don't necessarily have um, a lot of data or that hands-on technology in front of you. Um, always referring back to the mission, back to your main goal, uh, will always um, make the process uh, a lot easier. Um, when we're assessing cyber tools, as we are with this methodology, or just in general, um, the analogy I like to, to, to use is uh, you may have two tools. You may have a hammer and you may have a screwdriver. How do you compare the two and say which tool is, is, is better? Well, that comes down to the mission. What are you trying to do? If you're trying to put something into a wall, the hammer is uh, a better tool. If you're trying to fasten something down, then obviously the screwdriver is a better tool. So a lot of it depends on the mission. Um, so step one is defining that mission set. After that, you want to identify key technologies of your solution that can help you accomplish uh, the mission and the subtasks of that mission. Then you want to define measures of effectiveness. How will, how will you measure? Um, how will you analyze how well these key technologies are performing. Then you wanna identify threats to those measure of, measures of effectiveness. Um, after that, you can categorize those threats um, using the stride uh, methodology. Um, this is the first part of the methodology that can be uh, customized. Uh, stride is a, is a mnemonic for security threats that um, put threats in six different categories. Um, I'll talk more about that in depth um, as we move forward. Um, step six is computing your risk score based on the measure measures of effectiveness. Um, your risk scores, your likelihood of impact. There we use the dread methodology, um, heavily used in industry practice uh, by Microsoft and other large companies. Again, uh, dread is a another risk assessment model um, that we'll talk about um, a little bit further, which focuses more on, on the impact. Um, and then finally, we will prior, we will prioritize our threats uh, based on mission sets.
Sorry about that. So one thing I would like to hit on uh, before before moving forward is that the the methodology that we created um, is based on the effective effectiveness analysis process. Um, from the Office of Aerospace Studies. Um, within that handbook, um, it states that the effectiveness, effectiveness analysis is actually the most complex part of the AOA. Um, the goal of this analysis is to determine the worth of the different alternatives being considered when trying to perform mission tasks. Again, they have a focus on mission tasks as well. Um, our methodology um, is adapted from that effectiveness analysis process. Um, there are certain parts that we do not include that aren't um, applicable to what we're trying to do early on in the acquisition process, but overall, um, this is the process that was used as a basis for our network methodology, and we include this uh, in our references. So overall, the network survivability analysis process uh, contains four phases. Um, scoping, co collection, analysis, um, and then reporting. Um, at the very beginning, um, you start with your requirements, um, which is your analysis of alternative study plan. Um, you would then focus on the mission, determine your mission task. What are you trying to accomplish? Um, try and define that as um, detailed as possible. You would then identify key technologies or subcomponents of the of an alternative that will help you accomplish your mission task. You would then um, come up with measures of effectiveness, how you will be able to measure how well your key technologies are performing um, in accomplishing those mission tasks. And at that point, you can then uh, create um, requests for information from different vendors um, who will be um, responding to your AOA um, to get that information back from the different alternatives. If you don't, if you don't already have that information available, then you can do a threat analysis and identify those threats and categorize them using um, our different me methodologies, uh, whether that be Stroud or Dread. Uh, calculate your risk score, then com compute your risk score, and then you um, you will be uh, presented with uh, the common stoplight chart that you can provide to decision makers, um, so they can then make their analysis um, based on the methodology. So now I will talk uh, in detail about each one of uh, the phases of the methodology. Um, so at the very beginning, um, this is this is this is probably the most important phase, uh, the scoping process, um, where you're you're examining your AOA study plan to identify the cybersecurity requirements um, for each one of your alternatives, um, and then try to define those mission tasks as well as different measures of effectiveness of how you can assess how well these cyber tools um, will perform. And the collection process is all about trying to gather as much information as possible. Um, we do understand that early on in the acquisition um, life cycle, you don't necessarily have um, a fully built product but as much data as you can um, gather at this point, um, the more it will help you um, later on. Um, the cyber measures of effectiveness um, should tie um, directly to um, the specific um, subsections of cybersecurity, confidentiality, integrity, availability, authentication, non-repudiation, uh, as we'll talk a little bit more about when we um, dive into uh, different parts of the me methodology as well. This is where you can now translate that into a vendor RFI to request the specific information um, from those vendors. How will your key technologies uh, address specific parts of cybersecurity that, that we're looking for for our different alternatives? The, the analysis process is where we would use um, the stride methodology 
uh, for our categorization, as well as the DREAD methodology for our risk impacts um, to do our, our, our risk assessments. Um, I have a sample analysis uh, towards the, the end of this presentation, which will hopefully uh, make things a little bit uh, more clear and easy, more easily understood. But the analysis phase is primarily once you have all your data um, where you can get your stakeholders in your room as well as your subject matter experts perform your cyber tabletop type assessment using uh, this methodology. So this is the actual analysis that it, that it, this is where the actual analysis takes place. And then lastly, uh, just the reporting process. Um, we use a, a, a similar stoplight chart um, that most senior leaders are, are familiar with, um, which are tied to measures of effectiveness um, and the different subtasks of the missions. Um, so this way you could kind of compare um, how each of the alternatives perform in relation to specific missions. Um, and then that's, that overall score can be rolled up or you can look at um, just sub 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 level mission task um, if you prefer. So that's that's how the the results will be shown. Um, later on in the pre presentation, we have a sample analysis, um, so you can see how all that is rolled up. So this is a example of the assessment uh, resulting table. Um, for example, there's just a notional example with three different alternatives. Um, broke in this case, we broke down the mission into three uh, mission tasks, and then um, those three mission tasks are also broke down into three measures of effectiveness. Um, three different ways to analyze how well those key technologies perform those missions, um, and each alternative can then get a score um, based on uh, the stride and dread methodology that we use. Um, over, overall, these scores can be weighted differently. That's where you have the ability to kind of configure uh, the methodology for your specific use. Um, some things can be weighted if you're if you're if you're more focused on confidentiality versus integrity versus availability. Um, that's where you have the wiggle room to um, configure this method methodology specifically to your needs. But this is just the overall reporting template um, that you will see. Um, so now to kind of just bring the idea home, since it's kind of very abstract and just a high level of what the process is, um, these next couple slides will go through a sample analysis um, using ant anti enterprise antivirus software. Um, just as our notional example, um, again, this is this is not uh, real world data. This is just a high level, just to give you guys an example of of how this could actually be used. So at the, at the very um, beginning, you wanna go through your scoping, make sure um, that you have your goals and your mission set, um, which is the key part of this methodology. So you ask yourself, what, what is the requirement here? Um, the requirement is to perform cyber risk assessment of AV software um, running on enterprise networks. Um, there could be many mission, mission tasks associated with uh, that requirement, but, uh, for the sake of this analysis, we're just gonna focus on sending and receiving email. Um, so what is the overall question we're trying to answer? What are the security features do um, that piece of antivirus software provide when sending and receiving email? So at a high level, these are some of the questions that you're trying to have to kind of scope the analysis. Obviously it can be uh, way more detailed than this, um, but this is just an example to show you how the methodology can be used. So the next step is to identify our key technologies. When sending and receiving emails, what are our key technologies that will be used to do that? So you have your email client and your email server. Um, pretty simple, straightforward uh, example here. So now we need to define measures of effectiveness 
for our key technologies? How will we measure how well our key technologies are performing um, based on the mission or the task at hand? Um, so for the email client and for the email server, um, we need to look at outgoing email protection as well as inbound email protect protection. Um, for example, we can look at anti-phishing as well as email attachments. How well does the email client and the email server scan outgoing emails <clears throat> for viruses as well as scan incoming emails for viruses? As far as phishing, how well does it scan email for phishing characteristics? Um, and then the same thing for e email attachments. How well does it do um, as far as scanning email, email attachments for viruses themselves? Um, we know phishing is actually the most common cause of ransomware attacks, which have uh, been all over the news lately. So, uh, for example, we thought phishing would be uh, an applicable and, and, and timely um, example for, for this presentation. <clears throat> so in our next step, um, if you already don't have this information, this is when, um, because this, for specifically for this customer and this methodology, we're focused on early in, it, in the acquisition life cycle. At this point, you could create a vendor RFI based on those key technologies, based on that mission, based on those measure of, of effectiveness. So now you know what type of data you need in order to successfully um, conduct the cyber airway. Without some of these key pieces of data, it will be harder for you to um, conduct that airway. So lots of times we need to ask our question about what data do I need? Um, how can how how can we uh, help ourselves um, create a better analysis? So these are some of the key pieces of data that we would need uh, based on our defined mission. Um, yeah, antivirus policy configuration, the signature database, <clears throat> um, scanning documentation, the update process, how often it updates. How would you actually update the AV system? So now at this point, we need to identify threats related to our key technologies. So before we define out, outbound and inbound email protection, as well as anti-phishing, as well as scanning for email attachments, what are the threats associated with those? Well, obviously you have your email-based viruses, you have your phishing emails, and you have your, your viruses that are in your attachments. Um, obviously this is a, a notional example, so uh, the threats line up directly with some of the key technologies. But overall, this is how you would how you would like to step through the process. So now at this point, we have our threats, we have our missions defined, we have our key technologies, we have our measures of effective effectiveness defined. At this point, what we can use is the stride methodology um, created actually by Microsoft. Um, to categorize our threats based on our key technologies. Um, Stride, like I said before, is a, is a, is a mnemonic, um, stands for spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, um, and escalation of privilege. Um, you can actually see that each one of these threats is actually a violation of a desired cybersecurity property. So for example, spoofing violates authenticity, tampering violates integrity, um, repudiation, non-repudiation, information disclosure, confidentiality, denial of service violates availability, escalation of privilege um, violates auth authorization. So here's where you actually have some wiggle room to configure it based on your needs. Um, if you're more concerned with confidentiality, then now you can see based on the threats you have associated with your um, with the threats you have associated with information disclosure, you can now see, well, I'm really concerned with confidentiality. I have a bunch of threats associated with information disclosure. So Stride is just a way to kind of cat categorize your threats. Um, it's just a methodology that's used um, in industry practice, like I said, uh, developed by Microsoft. But if you have a different way that you would like to categorize your threats, you can use that. Or like I said, um, each one of these is a violation of a desired property of 
cybersecurity, you can just use those cybersecurity terms and categorize your threats based on the violation of CIA, if you prefer. Now, the other methodology we use is, is DREAD, which is also another mnemonic, um, which stands for damage, uh, reproducibility, exploitability, affected users, and discoverability. DREAD is really more focused on impact, whereas Stride was, was focused on categorizing the threats. DREAD um, actually designed uh, an impact score, quote unquote, um, to your different threats. So whether you're looking at um, your email-based virus incoming or outgoing phishing or your attachment viruses, you can now assign a score based on uh, the dread risk model. Um, and then what you see on the right-hand side is just an average of those scores. Um, like I said before, this can be changed based on your specific use case. Um, if you're more worried about effective users, you can have that weighted differently. But for this case, it's just a straight average uh, across the board. So just to define it a little bit more, so damage is how bad the attack will be, reproducibility, how easy is it to reproduce the attack, exploitability, um, how much work is necessary to actually launch that attack, effective users, how many people total are impacted, um, discoverability, how easy is it to discover the threat. Like I said, this methodology can be used as the basis for your cyber tabletop exercise. Obviously, there is going to be some subjectivity based on who's in the room. That's why it's um, it's always important to make sure you have the right representatives um, in there and the right stakeholders necessary. But this can be used um, as a framework to help facilitate that cyber tabletop exercise. And like I said, there is some um, configuration that can be done for your specific use case if there's certain things that you're um, more concerned with or less concerned. One second. using the stride methodology and then assigning an impact still there phil looks like you might have had a little bit of technical difficulties but i think the slides are back up okay On slide number 18, or is it a different number? So hopefully everybody can see the slides. I'm now on slide 18. I know we had some technical difficulties. It looks like Phil's having a little bit of technical difficulties on his end. So we'll give him a moment. Um, I will message him. It's like, hey, hey, Brian. Back. Oh, there you go. You back? Yeah, I'm back. I'm not sure. Uh, I believe I'm still on slide 18. Uh, okay. I believe we started having trouble on slide 17, but I believe I was able to conclude the point on that before we started having our technical difficulties. If not, um, I'll address the questions at the end. We can always go back. Um, right. But we're on slide 18 now, um, which is compute risk score. Hopefully, we don't have any trouble moving forward. Um, but one of the things that we thought was important to add to our methodology was a technical implementation score. Um, part of this was based on uh, my experience as well as uh, the other people on the team um, across the main solutions in that risk assessment. 
um, as well as a familiarity with NIST 853 and those security controls. Um, if you're familiar with that space, um, the controls have are categorized in low impact, moderate impact, high impact. Um, so we thought the same thing should be implemented here um, because all security controls, all security features are not implemented alike. Um, just the fact that um, you have antivirus on your machine. We all know as cybersecurity professionals, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're fully protected. Um, so we needed to have a way to um, analyze how well um, a security feature was actually implemented, whether that be substantially minim minimally implemented or insufficiently implemented. So for example here, substantially would be um, blocking over 75% of known viruses, minimally would be over 25%, and insufficiently would be under 25%. Obviously, there's some, subje some subjectivity here, but this is, we think, is a key point. Um, if you lock your front door versus if you have a guard dog versus if you have um, a full alarm system are different levels of security in protecting your house. Um, you wouldn't necessarily have a binary checkbox that says, do you have security in your home, yes or no. Um, there's obviously different levels. So we thought adding this te technical implementation score um, to the methodology uh, was an important piece. So based on that, um, each of the measures of effectiveness um, are categorized with STRED, with, with, with the STRIDE model, sorry. Um, then the risk impact score um, can be defined using DRED. Then we, we multiply that based on what you saw in the last slide with the technical implementation score to come up with our uh, final results. So each of the alternatives in this notional example, um, five alternatives, would then have a score based on each one of the measures of effectiveness for each key technology, whether that be sending and receiving email on the client side or the service side. Um, then at that point, um, based on user input, um, you can then actually roll this up into one score for each alternative, which we thought at our level would be um, too high level. We wanted to provide uh, as much granular information as possible. And then that can be weighted differently. Um, for example, if measures of effectiveness 1-1 and 1-2 are more important than 1-3 and 1-4, then it wouldn't just be a simple average. But our assessment, um, we tried to keep it at the item level um, and we tried to keep it very specific related to each specific measures of effectiveness. And that is my last slide. Um, these are our references here. Um, I know we did have some technical difficulties. Um, I'm not sure um, what information was missed or not missed. Um, uh, we do have a little bit of time. I, I finished a little early, so I'm, I'm definitely uh, available to go back and go over any slides. That, that you may have missed. Um, but at this point, uh, I'll answer any questions that we have in the chat. Perfect, thanks, Phil. Um, we did get a few questions, um, and so I'll get ready and put them on the screen so you can answer those. Um, but I do wanna remind everybody else, if you do have any questions as we go through these, still time to put them in the queue. Um, should be a little dialogue box, top middle of your screen. If you're in the, um, if you're in the any meeting online platform, you can enter your question there, add it, and we'll uh, address it in order. So without further ado, let me do the first one here. Okay, so just general question that came in towards the beginning, so asking if this, this general methodology, does this cross all mission areas, warfighting, business, intel support, and IEI, or EIE? Um, it can. Um... Unfortunately, um, in cybersecurity, a lot of times the answer is always, it depends, unfortunately, but um, it can. This was specifically um, made to do cybersecurity AOAs. Um, however, um, if you were going to apply this to business, for example, um, the stride and the dread methodology, well, specifically stride maybe would not necessarily apply, but something like dread, which affects mostly impact, damage uh, reproducibility, exploitability, affected users, and discoverability, that is something that's a little bit more universally applicable. Um, so it can, but it was specifically made to do um, cyber airways early in the acquisition lifecycle. 
Very good. Thanks, Phil. All right. Uh, next question it says, uh, has this process been modeled and does it exist as something like a SysML model? Um, it, it does not, um, not as, not, a, not as of right now. Um, as far as I know, this was something that was developed specifically for our army customer. I'm not sure, um, if I'm allowed to say specifically, um, in this, in this forum, um, but they have used it specifically for some of their airways. Um, and like I said, they, they configured it for their specific use case. Um, the example that I used was obviously cherry pick. Um, with enterprise uh, antivirus software, but they actually used it to um, analyze specific characteristics of a weapon system, the cybersecurity capabilities of a weapon system. So it wasn't even necessarily used for something specifically for cybersecurity. Um, so you can use it um, for weapon systems as well um, to analyze the cybersecurity capabilities um, there. Um, there was talk about trying to extend this um, to be included in some of their other tools um, at the time, but as of to date, I don't think that that has that's something that has been done as of yet. Okay, very good, thank you. All right, the next question here uh, just asks if the risk dread is it based on CVSS scoring practice? Um, it is not. Um, the categories are uh, a little bit more high level um, than NIST, um, CVSS. Um, NIST is a little bit more detailed, for a lack of a better word. Um, but there's no reason that um, you could not use both. Um, Dread is uh, something previously used by Microsoft. Um, the CVSS is, is, is a little bit more detailed specifically rated to, um, specifically associated uh, with software vulnerabilities, whereas Dread is a little bit more high level. Okay. Next question asks, in your experience, is there a need to utilize both risk models, Stride and Dread, or are they better for different types of assessments? Um, they, the two models do, um, a little different thing. Stride is more categorization of your threats. So if you're worried about threats in a certain specific type of category, if you're working, if you're focused more on denial of service, or if you're focusing more on spoofing, that's what Stride will be able to tell you to kind of just put them in, in different buckets. Where Dread is really more um, focused on impact and assessing that impact. Um, instead of just giving an impact of five, you can say this many users have been affected or it's this easy to exploit this type of attack and things like that. So um, you can use them both, which was what we did in the example, um, or depending on your assessment, you may only be concerned with using one or the other, um, but they do two different things. Um, so I, I don't see any reason why you wouldn't be able to use both. Um, depending, it all depends on your use case. Uh, unfortunately, my answer is it depends as well, but they do have slightly two different um, um, aims um, in 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 their in their creation. Okay. Thanks, Phil. And uh, follow up to the previous question um, about whether it's been this has been modeled and it, if it exists as a SysML model. Um, just the, the comment was that that this might be something of interest to include in the future vertical lift architecture framework model um, that PEO Aviation might be interested in. So um, I'll, I'll just leave that out there to comment. I don't know if you wanna have any other follow-up comments that maybe, you know, they could. Um, well, I guess because, because it came up and because it, it was a specific question, um, when I was supporting my Army customer, one of the AOAs that we use this on was actually future Future Vertical Lift. Now, Future Vertical Lift is a big program. Um, how It wasn't used specifically how we showed it today um, in our presentation. There were a lot of modifications that were done, but um, it did help them perform the cyber AOA um, for a specific part of that um, in relation to some of those alternatives, um, looking at um, 
you know, the Black Hawk and the UH-60 and the B-22 helicopters and things like that. Um, that's something I could talk about offline. I could reach back out to some of those POCs to see um, where they are at um, with that AOA now. Um, I know there was um, there were there were a lot of different parts and there was some some follow up discussions going on about how um, they should move forward um, with with different iterations of that. So um, if you if you, feel free to contact me offline and we could talk a little bit more about that. Yep, no, that's exactly what I was going to recommend. Yeah, your I believe your contact information was on the cover of the slides that again folks can download so they can get in touch with you that way. Okay. Very good. All right. Uh, the next question we have in queue it says, uh, "Could you use this method methodology with determining the security of a cross-domain solution? If so, would you recommend implementing it in the same way?" Um. You. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to be very careful uh, about how I answer that question because I worked in a cross domain solution space for a long time and I know a lot of those guys and they do great work. Um, you could, but um, CDSs are, are such a niche technology and almost by default, whenever you implement a CDS, you're increasing the risk posture of the two networks that are connected to the cross domain solution. So, um, you know, when I was there uh, working on that, they were using, you know, RDAC 2.3 and NSA was talking about raise the bar and stuff like that with um, um, new initiatives there. So that's a, that's a very specific use case. Um, it could be used. However, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't recommend using this methodology in spite of um, what the good folks at NSA and this have, have already implemented um, because um, that's such a, a quote unquote high risk environment. Um, this can be used in addition to, but I wouldn't use it instead of, if that makes sense. That's good. All right. Thanks, Phil. Um, looks like the next question might be our last one, unless, and there's still time if you want to put a question in queue. But this question asks uh, kind of a long ish one. It says, there seems to be a growing camp of those who are advocating non ordinal, not high, medium, low needs to be revisited. Do you have any thoughts related to what might be a good alternative to the historically embedded ordinal-based ranking or scoring systems? Um, that's, that's, a, that's a tough question. Um, so I, I, I understand what, he, what he's getting at. It all depends on, on your audience. Um, the high, medium, low, the stoplight charts, um, rather boring, but lots of times high level decision makers that's what they want to see um that's all that they wanted all that they want to see um if we just give them a number for example our methodology uh gives a number between zero and 30 and if we tell them that a risk is assigned to 25 what does that mean um so you have to give them some sort of context um I'm not sure. Um, that's something that we could probably talk talk about a little bit offline. Um, cybersecurity metrics is, could probably be a separate webinar. Um, I think using something like the dread model, where you have specific numbers um, related to impact, um, and not just a high, medium, low, or not just a one through ten, but you have a score related to affected users. You have a score related to how easy is it to re reproduce attack. I feel like going down that pathway, not to say that dread is the best or is the best model for that, but going down that pathway gets us to a point where we can have more meaningful results instead of just high, medium, low, or green, yellow, red. Um, the only reason stride and dread were, were used for our methodology today is because they were used by industry leaders, Stride being, you know, something that was actually produced by Microsoft. Um, but I, I agree with your question. Um, not 100% sure how to answer it, though, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks, Phil. Yep, and it looks like uh, contact information for that question right there, so we can, maybe you can follow up with them offline about that. Okay. All right. Uh, well, I think that is all the questions we have in queue. 
stop q and a i'll leave it back to our final slide uh for closing thanks so uh phil thank you for the presentation thank you everybody for joining um and i hope everyone has a great rest of your day and keep looking keep a look out for more csi webinars coming out uh, at, at least once a month and maybe some special ones in between so thank you all thanks